Hey, welcome to number 17 of Let's Consider Luke. It is 7.24 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, March 17th. Yeah, 2022. <clears throat> <clears throat> so one thing I promised myself, and keep in mind, I promised this to myself, not you, is that I wouldn't rabbit trail too much here. From here, hopefully here out. Because, big point to this was really comparing it to other Gospels, most specifically Matthew, just as a control. We don't have to assume that Matthew is, is way better or more accurate than Luke, necessarily. But if I had, con if I had, uh, compared it to the other three canonized, and that's canonized gospels, this would have, this would have gone into so many episodes. Yeah, <laughs> just, my goodness. So a lot of the points that I could get to and, and point out, um, I might not. I might just give you a little note like, Hey, and that's interesting, and we'll probably look at that at another time. So we're going to start at Luke 22. And just from my notes, verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2 doesn't give us nearly the detail that Matthew 26, 1 through 5, which would be considered a parallel to this, does give us. And I'll illustrate. Okay? So Luke 22, 1, now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called Passover. And the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. And it doesn't really say it here. It's interesting, because it doesn't really tell us here. But it's odd that they go from this thought, the chief priests and scribes sought how they might kill him, for they feared the people. I would assume that that means that they were doing it secretly or they wanted to kill him because if the people kept following them, that might be curtains for them. Not sure. But it's just a thought. It's just the first thing I notice when I read it. So here's supposedly the parallel account from Matthew 26, 1 through 5. And it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said unto his disciples, Ye know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. We get that term again. Huios, uh, eh, let me see, it's huios, or yeah, anthropos. So anyways, the direct, trans we went over this, like last time, I think, or the time before. This verse 2 is kind of interesting in its wording. And again, Koine Greek is definitely not what was once considered as Greek. They may call ancient Greek, and there are also various forms of Greek. It might uh, point out like Athenian Greek or Lesbian Greek, my favorite. Um, but the wording, depending on how the tenses of the words should exactly be used, believe it or not, may not be saying exactly what we think it's saying here. And that's something for another time. In fact, the whole study of this term used, son of man, and the fact that he seems to be speaking in third person, which I also pointed out, is worthy of probably its own presentation, which is certainly something I would like to get to. Dep heavily dependent <clears throat> on time and funding. All right, then 26.3, then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, <clears throat> he had a palace, and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said, not on the feast day, lest there be an uproar among the people. So the part where Luke left out, always remember, I know I'm being repetitious, but you have to be. This is part of the point to to remembering, you know, why something is very important. 
our enemies who have fed us lies our whole lives count on the repetition of those lies that's the only way they keep those lies alive is repetition everybody's familiar with a very very dubious event that they claim happened right around in the area of you know world war ii and in germany and poland and stuff and the way that they can keep that lie alive repetition 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 that's it <clears throat> but the inverse is also true in order to get our minds out of that prison that has, has been built for them we do need the repetition of more correct thought or if that's too subjective at least the counterpoint to this narrative or a counterpoint this is why I just repeat and repeat and repeat these certain things um, so yeah here's the the problem is this if we only had Luke and not Matthew or or another gospel that would complement and would tell us something like Matthew 26 5 tells us but they said not on the feast day lest there be an uproar of the people we wouldn't get that from Luke because as you saw with those two verses from Luke I didn't know exactly what it meant because it said they sought how they can kill him because they feared the people and if I only had Luke I'd be very confused but in Matthew we see a couple of things first off <clears throat> they say uh, not on the feast day lest there be an uproar among the people which tells me two things First off, that's at least in part why they feared the people. Secondly, that they had absolutely no respect for the feast day. They were only concerned about that, how the people might react. Not whether or not it was disrespectful to Yahweh to do such a thing on the, on the feast day. Tells you a lot about them. Matthew tells you a lot about them. Especially in this passage where Luke doesn't. Um interesting I've been writing a review on uh, Josephus in the New Testament and I'm pretty well through it I'm I'm at the really meaty part so it, it's taking some time because one of the big problems that Josephus and apocryphal literature and other things what they rely on is certain incorrect terminology and assumptions and that's <clears throat> one of the things we always have to attack is assumptions um, get to the epistemology what is the uh, epistemology or acquisition of knowledge or sources of knowledge are they correct accurate are they reliable and in so doing uh, there is a section uh, that uh, Mason entitled the Jewish priest or priesthood and this is sort of his commentary on what Josephus had to say about him as compared to what we see in the New Testament now I'm going through this terminology I'm looking at the Greek terminology used for different people and some of the terminology actually that's used for the priesthood or priests it's not I'm gonna say this I don't, I don't want to give anything away because this that review is going to be sort of its own little presentation like I don't know hour hour and a half and the reason it's going to be so long and it's just a big book review is because of the subject matter Josephus and how important uh, it is because outside of the Bible I don't know of any other author or books that have had more of an influence on the way that we perceive uh, the biblical world culture language people so on and so forth than the works called Josephus <clears throat> So it's 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 interesting and and you know definitely keep your ears out for that <clears throat> when I release that presentation which really shouldn't be too too long even the video end of it shouldn't take all that long to do it will be an audio visual so now um in my notes Luke 22 3 reads quote then entered Satan into Judas surnamed Iscariot being of the number of the twelve now compared to Matthew 26 14 then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went unto the chief priests in Matthew's account 
This is after the woman uses the expensive ointment on Jesus or Yusho's feet. This account is important in seeing what came next from Judas, which, by the way, his actual name in the, the Koine Greek is Yudet. Like the fourth son of Jacob, the tribe of Judah. His name is Judah, not Judas. I guess this distinguished him. And I got to say, so I, I have, um, I've watched various um, Paul critiques that are out there, some better than others. But some of them use the, some of this imagery, like, for instance, in Acts, where it says Paul goes to the house of Ananias and mentions a Judas again. Judas, ah, see there? Judas, that name Judas. He betrayed Christ, the name Judas. Well, the, the thing is, you can go to Revelation and you can find that list of the tribes that were being sealed and you'll find Judah in there. And you'll find Judah as a tribe, one of Jacob's 12 sons, elsewhere in the New Testament. And what you will find is, if you compare that name in the Koine to the name that they translate or transliterate as Judas, it's the same name. It's the same name. Something else that's interesting is, is actually Luke. And this could be a translational thing. Let's take a look. Yeah, I just want to point out something here um, that appears to me maybe more of um, an English uh, translation thing than necessarily the Greek. When we see this verse where it says, uh, Then entered Satan into Judas, sir named Iscariot. Nobody in the Bible had surnames. No one. I mean, you might have the sons of or son of, you know, Jesus, son of Joseph, um, Joab, the son of, of Zebedee, um, David, the son of Jesse. Okay. They didn't have surnames. So it's, um, it's interesting. It's odd and interesting that we see surnamed in this, uh, this King James version, which was said to have been penned in 1611. Though I don't think surname um, was something that was instituted until a hundred or more years later. Now, did surname mean something else back then than what we know surname to mean now? I mean, I don't know. Just looking at the Roots, a name shared in common to identify the members of a family, as distinguished from each member's given name. Also called family name, last name, a nickname or epithet added to a person's name. So I guess, at that time, it would have been a nickname or epithet it, when it was penned, if this, was, if this translation was done in 1611, like we're told then perhaps instead of us thinking surnamed, as in that was his last name, it was a nickname or epithet, which would make sense when we look at, for instance, like Matthew 10.3, the same word is used, which is epikeleomai in the, uh, the Koine. In Matthew, like they're, they're giving lists of people, and they, they list um, uh, Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, or that's something he was called, perhaps a nickname. <clears throat> we only see it once in Matthew um, concerning that Thaddeus, and really the rest of the time that we see this word, interesting enough, it's, it's all Lucian or Pauline, but uh, one once in, in one Peter. I don't want to get caught up in that, I, just kind of a side note, okay? All right, then, uh, continuing. So I said, yeah, that you might get an, an idea. Now, in Matthew's account, when the woman anoints his feet with whatever that perfume, essential oil, ointment, whatever it was, um, based on the language there, it was really, it's really pricey stuff. And 
you know, perhaps that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back for this Judah, who they're calling Judas, Judah, surnamed Judas. <laughs> um, it would have been a big deal, I think, to somebody who was being a bit more practical, like, you're going to let her use all of that. And they probably lived pretty meagerly in all that, you know. I'm just based on the story as we read it. I guess I could kind of see somebody looking at that like, man, that, that's so wasteful. That is so wasteful. I'm not saying he's right. Okay, but what I'm saying is Matthew at least gives us that insight in that account. Luke doesn't. So that's noteworthy. Um, the account uh, in Luke is a completely, it's, an, it's a completely different chronological order. So we would never know from Luke that that might actually have been what triggered, <laughs> we'll say triggered Judah slash Judas. Um, so yeah, in Luke, it's in actually 737, way, 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 way back in time, chronology, and in book space. Um, and it happened in Nain, this event. And it was just like the one that we see described in Matthew before this. But it's happening in a place called Nain, not Bethany, and at a Pharisee's house. It is quite different. Um, Okay, so now we move forward to Luke 22, 10 through 13, and we're going to compare that to what is supposed to be. It's complementary in Matthew 26, 18 through 19. The variations between these two, are they're, they're quite slight. I mean, they're not significant, but just to, to let you know what's going on there, I'm not going to, to necessarily read out the whole thing. Um... This is where he's describing to his disciples um, to go to the city and to find a certain place, and that's where we're going to eat uh, this Passover. As I said, the, the variations between the two, they're, they're very, very slight and minimal. They both stay pretty harmonious, so I don't think there's really much to pick at that would really do us any good here. The same with... Um, <clears throat> Luke 22, 14 through 23, as compared to Matthew 26, 20 through 29. Um, and this is really the institution of the Lord's Supper. Again, <clears throat> the variations are, are quite slight. I'm sure there's, there's plenty of applicable material to dig into concerning the institution of what we call the Lord's Supper, what it actually means, what it might really mean as compared to how we have instituted it or practiced it. First Sunday of every month. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, a lot of church buildings I've gone to, that's like, we're going to do the Lord's Supper, so we're going to do the Lord's Supper's first Sunday every month, and then what we do is, at the end, the preacher gets up and he, he says they're going to do the Lord's Supper, because it's the first Sunday of the month, he doesn't say that, but, and he just invites everybody who doesn't have the proper faith or who might be faltering in their faith and in a bad spot, he just wants to invite them to not come up. And I get why, trust me, I get why, which is, um, that's all heavily Pauline, by the way, the whys to that. But, um, I don't know that we've really understood that very well either. But moving forward, before we get caught up in that. <clears throat> now, the Luke 22, 24 through 30, this is where um, the disciples are having a bit of a tiff at the, uh, the Last Supper, the Passover meal, concerning who's the greatest. And it is very different and is quite out of chronological sequence with Matthew's. Matthew is all the way back in Matthew chapter 20. And in time, it was quite a long time before this. And there was 
actually a different outcome and there was different dialogue involved in it. So completely out of context, completely out of order, we would get a completely different sort of idea of the atmosphere at this Last Supper or Passover meal from Luke interjecting this argument over who's the greatest disciple here, as opposed to Matthew's putting it in a completely different context and situation quite a long time before. And that is a significant contrast and, and absolutely noteworthy. Now, you know, I do point out verses and passages and ideas found in Luke that's, that aren't found elsewhere. And this is one, uh, Luke 22, 31 and 32, <clears throat> where Jesus is purported by the author of Luke to have said, um, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I've prayed for you that your faith does not fail. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. <clears throat> Excuse me, not found anywhere else. Again, here's another one which I'm sure some people <laughs> wish were other places, uh, but it's not. I'm afraid it's only found in Luke, and that is Luke 22, 35 through 38. Let him get a sword. It's not found. And most people would know that passage where he says, when I sent you out, did you need anything? And they said, no. And he says, now get a sword. And if you have to sell certain things to get a sword. I thought it was of interest, first off, that it isn't anywhere. It's, it's not in any of the other accounts that he says that. I did think it was kind of interesting, though. In this, it's uh, the word use. The operative word here is G3162, Mahira. Hopefully that's pronounced right, because I just have a transliteration of it here, not the original Greek. <clears throat> it's more appropriately, this word, weapon. Not necessarily sword. G4501, Romphea, is sword as well. If it's derived from the Obery root, Har, it would have more to do with a weapon or strife than an actual sword. So more of a generic term. Even the Strong's Greek claims its root is G3163, make, fighting or strife. Again, in Obri, the yik, ek, uk, and mik have to do with striking, not necessarily with a sword, per se. Especially a word like mik. <clears throat> well, one thing you'll find in Obri is that M in a simple root. It's almost a, a type of, I don't know if we would call it increasing, but in a sense, it really tends to have the effect on um, amplifying the glyph that comes after it. The glyph that comes after it has, has all the, uh, the earmarks of having to do with the hand or energy striking physical you know something so it makes complete sense again not necessarily sword per se but a weapon striking something like that and this idea of sell and get a sword it goes contrary to matthew 26 52 through 54 he who lives by the sword will die by the sword, which, again, even though it's, it goes contrary to what we see him saying in Matthew, when, when the author of Matthew says that Peter struck off the ear of one of those men that came to get him, okay, even though there's a contradiction between Luke and Matthew, the thing is, <clears throat> what he's saying in Luke would actually be more harmonious to ideas that we would find in the Old Testament. Um, there's a lot of passages in the Old Testament. The Old Testament has absolutely no material whatsoever speaking against anyone having swords, weapons, to defend themselves against the enemy. It does speak against putting our faith in 
uh, weapons, strength, and other things, as opposed to putting our faith in preservation through the, the strength of Yahweh. But we're not talking about that here. Okay. <clears throat> Luke 22, 39 through 46, Jesus prays thrice, different to other accounts. Matthew 26, 36 through 46, and Luke 22, 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. That description of his sweat being like great drops of blood, and I've heard people really get kind of strange and and morose with speculation on that not found elsewhere only luke um <clears throat> also luke 22:43 and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven strengthening him not found elsewhere the one thing about for instance <coughs> man i've got something in my throat the one thing for instance that you'll see as far as themes go more in Luke than you're going to find especially in Matthew and Mark. And we saw this earlier in the chapter where he says that Satan entered into Judas. Here angels came and ministered to him. Luke is the only account that in which it's said that Jesus says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Luke is the only gospel that constantly lauds the value of the Samaritan in opposition, literally in opposition to other gospels, specifically Matthew, who does not whatsoever. And the Old Testament, which tells us exactly the, the composition of the people and their actions that are called Samaritans, that would be called Samaritans in the New Testament. So this heavy emphasis on spirituality in the sense of like Satan this and Satan that and angels this and angels that, I'm just saying you're going to see it a lot more in Luke. Let's just say compared to the other two synoptic gospels specifically. Uh, Luke twenty two forty six and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. However, Matthew twenty six forty five, then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now, and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. In Matthew, he prays thrice. Luke, twice. And I, I'm sorry, I guess I put that wrong. I should have put twice up top. I apologize when I said prays thrice earlier. So yeah, in Matthew, he prays three times. Luke, two times. And just to drive this point home, in Luke, when he finally comes to his disciples, he tells them, rise and pray, lest you enter into temptation. Uh, in Matthew, when he finally comes to his disciples, he says, sleep on now and take your rest. I would call that a straight-up contradiction. Unless one could say, well, Luke left out the third time he went to pray, and then he would have said that afterwards. Well, you can speculate that that's the case, but you can't prove that from the text. And that's a problem. Um, now, I did write in addition in my notes that it's unclear how anyone could read either Luke or Matthew or Mark's account and think Jesus was God or a God. Now, this is concerning the, the praying, whether it was two times or three times. Here we see his will is decidedly different to the Father's. He is saying, as a paraphrase, If I could get out of this, I would. 
again. He's literally saying in his prayer, if I could get out of this. If this could be passed to somebody else, that ain't me. I'd go for that. I would be very happy to do that. I would like not to do this. And then, but not my will, thy will. I would imagine, or I would hope, that a lot of people listening to this would know what that feels like. To think, feel, then say, in prayer, out loud, however, to Yahweh. I would rather this happen to anybody but me, or it's just not at all. I would prefer this wasn't happening. I would like to not do this thing. I would like not to be in pain anymore. I would like not to be in this situation anymore. I would like not to be the leader of this thing. I would like not to be burdened with these things that I must do, that I am burdened with. I would like not. I would very much like to not do this. But if it's your will, then I'm glad to continue because that's what's best. An appropriate prayer, however, if he was God the Son, the second person of the Holy Trinity, I can't even imagine him having, at any time, to any degree, any thought or will in variance to the first person of the Trinity. Even the thought of that being possible would like deconstruct everything we would understand about God in the sort of evangelical Trinitarian or Catholic Trinitarian, the, both the same Trinitarian ideas. That's all, that's all Protestantism and evangelicalism is. It's Catholicism with kind of a different name and, and, and smaller, more localized popes. But I think this is a great example of how he was not God or a God. He had a different will. He had a different will. Th that does not compute. Not if he's God. Um, you just couldn't pray that because... First off, if, if he was a God, member of the Trinity, having foreknowledge, what was everything that was going to happen, he would know the efficacy of it. He would know that it was something passing and so on and so forth. I mean, if he was actually a God or God, second person of the Trinity, then this prayer is for show. And of course, Trinitarians have to come up with all of these excuses for, well, you know, when he was in bodily form, he would have been limited in certain ways. I don't believe that either. I don't believe that either. I don't believe that a God, by definition, can be limited, can limit himself. I don't believe a God, by definition, can limit himself spatially can limit himself as far as his knowledge, can limit himself as far as his power. Nope. Don't believe that. Don't believe it's possible. You can't be a god by nature and character and substance if that's possible. I mean, you have heard those old adages that people would say, like, can God create a a stone that's too heavy for him to lift? 
and a lot of them are kind of stupid. But this one, I think, is quite appropriate. He could not, by nature, substance, be God if he at any time had a will in opposition to, if he's part of this, this mystical trinity, another person in the trinity. Then we've got, we don't just have problems. The second he has a will that's different than anyone else, any other person in the trinity, whether, it doesn't matter what form he's in, the minute he's got a will, that there's no more trinity. There's no more trinity. Then there's just three gods. No trinity. It's so important. That's so important. This, this passage and others, like for instance, when he says, he, you know, only the father knows this and the father knows that. Okay. Well, I would say that's case closed. Case closed. Because they literally have to come up with ridiculous mental gymnastics that say things like, well, I mean, when he was a man, he was limited in certain ways as a man. What? What? What are you talking about? You understand nothing about the concept of God and Almighty and all powerful and all present and all this and all that and all the other. The definition of God. You can't be limited. You can't limit what he knows. If you can, He's not in the Trinity, and you've got separate gods, or you've got sub-gods, or something. And if he is, and he isn't part of the Trinity, and he wasn't limited in, in any of those ways, then it was just for show. It was just for show. It was disingenuous and just for show. It was an act. And what's an act or a show? It's not the truth. It's not genuine. So now you've got an untruthful, ungenuine, kind of lying, deceitful God. So now we're getting like, we're moving closer and closer towards essentially a very pagan outlook of very base gods that basically run around and, and, and do really crappy kind of low life, low minded things, think with their dicks. That's literally what we're moving towards if we're going to do that. If we're going to accept this, then we're just going to, you know, it's a step or two and we're going to move and get to there. I won't read the rest of my notes on that. I think I've said, <laughs> I think I've said what there is to say on that for now. For now. Um, so, yeah. Anyways, so Luke. 22, 47 through 53, the, the betrayal and the guards here. They, it does vary to different accounts. <clears throat> there are a few differences between the accounts of, um, you know, like the betrayal, them coming to arrest him. Relatively significant. In Luke, it says, um, now, this is almost the same as the first uh, so-called parallel verse in Matthew. While he yet spoke, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said unto him, Gross, fag. No, he didn't. <clears throat> in Luke's account, I'm going to hell. In Luke's account, he says, Judas, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Now, that's actually, it's not in Matthew. As I said, I mean, there are, are definitely some parts that, that are, are similar, like the first verse. Almost the same. The wording's just slightly changed, but same specifics in there. But in Matthew, it says, Now, he that betrayed him gave them a sign gave him a sign saying, all right, whomsoever I shall kiss. <laughs> and they said, <laughs> they said, gross, <laughs> fag. No, they didn't. <laughs> Anyways, the same as he, hold him fast, <laughs> hold him fast so I can kiss him. 
<laughs> he didn't. I know, he didn't. And I know all you... <laughs> all you people out there without a sense of humor are <laughs> saying... You just, you're just saying, oh, he's so awful. I wish you would take this more seriously. <laughs> I do. I do, okay? But... <laughs> All right. Now, <laughs> I don't know. I just, I'm not all that enthused. Like, I kiss my son. I do. I'm not that enthused about kissing any other guy. <laughs> not, not in any way. <laughs> I don't care if it's on the cheek or on the ear. <laughs> I'm just, I'm really unenthused about that. Just, Though, maybe it's just me. So, um, some differences. Um, in Matthew, he doesn't say to him, um, you betray the Son of Man with a kiss, there's the Son of Man. Um, in Matthew, he says, friend, wherefore art thou come? And now this is the account where, um, it said that one of them stretched out his hand, he drew his sword, and he struck the servant of the high, high priest and smote his ear. Now, in Luke, it, it does actually say the same thing. And then uh, in Matthew, that's the verse that I just went over earlier, where he says, put the sword away, he who... And we're not doing Matthew, so I don't want a rabbit trail into the oddity of him saying that in comparison to what we we see throughout the Old Testament. So I won't, I guess I won't say that. Um, but back to Luke. Uh, it, again, it, it is similar in the sense that for some reason I keep losing my place when I go from the one to the other. I guess I can't keep my marker when that happens. That's unfortunate. The same thing does happen in Luke as Matthew in the sense that um, it does say one of them, it's nondescript, uh, stretched out his hand, drew the sword, struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear, uh, put the sword again into his place, it says that Jesus said in Luke, uh, for all they that take the sword, so, no, I'm in Matthew. I got all distracted by the boys kissing boys and um sorry. So in Luke, um, and it says one of them smote the servant of the high priest again, nondescript, I was right, cut off his ear. Um and and it says Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far. I don't know if that means stop. It's a little cryptic, but uh, it says, and he touched the ear and he healed him. Um, and then a lot of the dialogue, pretty much the same. So, not really a lot. You can just nitpick through it. Um, I mean, I would honestly say, like, if I was just saying, hey, I'm commenting on Luke, and there's these parallel passages in Matthew, I would say, yeah, you know, because there's not, I don't think there's so many differences between the two that you would get too hung up. You could see him as a comparison as opposed to a lot of contrast, though there are contrasting elements. There certainly are. Um, now, Luke does omit Judah, called Judas, giving back the money and hanging himself, which Matthew 27, 3 through 10 does. But oddly enough, um, try not to lose my place here in Luke 22, 63, but oddly enough, I seem to remember in Acts, Acts chapter 1. Now, this is extemporaneous. I'm just um, 
on the fly here. It's not. It's uh, spontaneous, not extemporaneous. Because I have I have no notes uh, alluding to this. Uh, so in Acts one sixteen, men. This is so they say that Peter stood up. They were trying to decide a a new disciple slash apostle to replace Judah, Judas. And what they wanted is they specifically wanted somebody who had been with them for some time and was an eyewitness. It was so important to them. Eyewitness. Which Paul was not. That's important. So, it says that Peter stood up and he said in Acts one sixteen, Men, brethren... This scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus. I won't TSK cross-reference that. I know I clicked on it, and I'm, <laughs> I'm fighting to not cross-reference that from David. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. Now I know a little something about hanging. And I don't think that that typically happens. I don't think it typically happens. Anyways. So, it's hard to say that that's even a parallel from Luke. Because I'm not seeing anything about Hank falling headlong. He burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed out. I would not know what kind of death that was, per se. But, and... Mighty painful. Mighty painful. Um, I'm kind of weirded out at a lot of accounts that I've I've seen in the Bible, and I don't <clears throat> I don't know how accurate they are in translation. Where we see things like, um, for instance, like Saul knew he was going to die, and. Um, or knew he was going to be taken by the Philistines, right? And thought he was going to be tortured or, or something. So his idea was, well, what I'll do is I'll kill myself by falling on my sword. <clears throat> now, I don't know. I don't know how big a thing culturally masochism was we do see it in for instance samurai culture which i think there's plenty of evidence that would lead us to believe that they got that culture from white folks i don't know specifically israelites okay if that's that sort of masochistic thing if it's translated correctly um was sort of cross-cultural. But you have to wonder what it was that he did exactly. That would have made him, like, burst open. Unless he, like, threw himself off of, like, a cliff onto jagged rocks. Uh, even so, that account of Peter's, that's really descriptive. That's really descriptive. And um, not quite the description that we see in Matthew, and then, of course, it's not in, in Luke at all. Go figure. I am just going to say a few things about the rest of the verses in Luke 22, because I don't really have much for notes on them, and I'm not sure why I read through here and, and didn't really take much for notes on this. Um, <clears throat> a couple of probably relatively minor differences is, for instance, um, yeah, let's see. 
That's interesting. You see, Luke describes the place where the high priest lives as oikos. Okay, which would be house. Oh, they're not going to let me go back to Matthew. Anyways, Matthew, let's see if I can get this in the TSK or not. Afar off into the high priest's palace, G833. I mean, just for kicks. Why not? I'm in the Greek here. G833. Hmm. Aule. Aule. Huh? Wait. Really? Aule from the same as air? No. And that is not from the same as air. That's complete BS. Why does that matter? Well, um... Because in Obri, that would be, it's just very similar to the to just the word tent, the word that's often translated as as tent. Um, but they're calling it palace. Um, it does appear in Luke. It's it's not like whoever knew Luke didn't didn't know that word. But Luke is is using oikos, which is really more specifically house where. It, you gotta wonder why are they using this kind of dubious word that they're not giving a, 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 a good etymology on here. I won't get too caught up in that. Now, something that's kind of weird is, okay, if Peter was the one who cut off the guards here, man, <laughs> See, he's, he's obviously shown some violent tendencies and, and he might he might not be the guy who we'd want around for sure. Okay, so even though we see that Jesus heals the guard's ear, um, you still have to wonder why he didn't have to try to talk those guards out of taking Peter into for whatever reason or something. That and doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Okay, I'm just pointing out it doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, the whole denial part um, and the specifics of the denial part. There's really not a huge difference. I I don't think huge difference between uh, Luke and Matthew. Uh, interesting though. Let's one or two more things. Now, there are rather significant differences in the rest of the chapter of Luke 22 and what we would see in the rest of Matthew chapter 26. The first one is in, in Matthew 26, it, they're a little bit more detailed in the fact that it's saying that these leaders, these various leaders, were seeking witnesses to witness against him, false witnesses against him. Uh, we don't really get that at all period, in Luke. And it was after they had gone through all of these motions of these false witnesses, and I think they finally got one false witness, and then they got him to basically sort of kind of admit something that they wanted him to admit, and then after that, it was, it was then that they said that they were being abusive to him. In Luke's account, it, we get detail on Peter and the denial from Peter, but then it just it just goes right into after um, Peter's denial. It goes into this part which would have happened in Matthew after this the whole questioning period uh, that that would have taken some time because we're talking about witnesses, false witnesses, whatever, but witnesses and testimony. And, and asking and waiting for answers and deliberating and all of that stuff. And then they begin to be very abusive to him after that. See, in Matthew, they get what they claim is a confession from him. Okay, they're building a very, very uh, a damning case against him in Matthew. Okay, so it's after they build this case and supposedly they... Um, <clears throat> 
they demonstrate, you know, these these, these terrible things about him. And then it says, and then they begin to be abusive to him and treat him abusively and strike him and so on and so forth, which makes sense. Okay. If they, if they got some kind of what they say was a confession out of him and Matthew, then it makes sense. Oh, now they're, they're being abusive to them, uh, to him. And Luke doesn't say they've done anything yet. Nothing. Nothing. There's, they say they bring they bring Jesus in. They say Peter follows him. There's the account of his denial, standing by, around the fire and people recognizing him. And then we go straight to um, in Luke twenty two sixty three. And then the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, "Prophesy, who is it that smote you?" And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. They're saying that they did this out of the gate. No confession, none of these witnesses called, none of this deliberation, nothing. They've got nothing on them, so they're telling us, Luke, what's the picture Luke is painting? Because when Luke would have been writing this, of course, the wording he was using, Udeus, and anybody reading this would have understood that is literally just a Greek transliteration of Judah, the men of Judah, not Jews. And it's painting a very ugly picture of these, these brutal people, the men of Judah. Luke is. Matthew isn't. Now, Matthew's picture is not still not necessarily all that great, but we are seeing a contrasting picture between Luke and Matthew, like a clearly contrasting picture between them. Because in Luke, it's saying after they, they did all this abusive stuff to him, then... And this is very, this is a very different kind of timeline too that we see in Luke. Starting at Luke 22, 66, it says, and then, then as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council as soon as it was day. So Peter would have already denied him by this time, right? Because he said, when the cock crows thrice, they said, as soon as it was day, they led him in to try to, you know, question him and find him guilty, because they, they needed a pretext, correct? And then they say, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, ye will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. And this is so radically different than anything else we see. Um, then they said, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, Yea, ye say that I am. And they said, What need we have any for... <laughs> what need? In King James English, they said, What needeth we hatheth any with witneth the thith? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. I would imagine people who actually talked like that would go around kissing other boys. But, just real quick, in Matthew, kind of see the contrast there a little bit. So yeah, um, in Matthew, there is the betrayal and arrest. Um, and we have, a, let's see, Jesus before Caiaphas and the council. Peter denies Jesus. So that's radically out of order. In Luke, they had the arrest. He's taken into Caiaphas. And they give us the account that Peter followed. He was warming himself by a fire there, and people recognized him. And he denied him, denied him, denied him, and cursed and ran out. And then they say, and then, so they started abusing Jesus. They blindfolded him and they smacked him and said, who's hitting you and all that stuff. And then, this is Luke still, okay, right? Then they said, at the break of day, at sunlight, then they brought him into this council to start questioning him. That's what Luke's saying, okay? In Matthew, it was still the middle of the night that they took him. And we go right from them taking him at this Mount of Olives to Jesus before Caiaphas and the council. And it says, And they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. And then Peter followed afar 
And he went in and he sat with the servants to see the end. That's what Matthew says. Now the chief priests and elders in all the councils sought these false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. This is important. Remember, they feared the people. They feared the people. Like, if, if Luke was right in the first part of chapter 22 when he says they feared the people, they were plotting because they feared the people. He was so popular, they feared the people. So, of course, what do they do? They go and arrest him at night. They bring him in and they start abusing him before they even have any kind of pretext, any kind of charge where they could justify what they're doing. That doesn't make sense. If they feared the people, they're going to abuse him before they even get their pretext, their charge, something that they can lay against him. Sounds contradictory to me. But continuing in Matthew, um, but they didn't find any. They were looking for these false witnesses to say something terrible. They could get them on. They found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, found they none. So their stories kind of sucked. And the last came two false witnesses and said, This fellow said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Which sounds really kind of stupid. If they were literally thinking he was talking about the actual temple, that just sounds like such a spurious claim. I could just see somebody sitting there in court. We're holding a court session on this guy. And these two witnesses c come in to try to give us some good rock solid proof of how horrible this guy is. And, and they come in and they say, oh yeah, oh yeah, he's bad news. Let me tell you, he said he could tear down First Street Baptist Church and build it back up in three days. Okay, so when that happened, I would be, if I was on that council, I would be like turning to the guy like, get them, get them out of here. Get them out of here. Ow, 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 ow. No more need for testimony from these two witnesses. In fact, why don't we keep them because we have a good doctor that maybe they need to talk to after this. It just, again, to me, it doesn't sound all that credible. Like, why would you even bring in these guys saying that? I really don't take any of this for granted. Like, oh, yeah. Oh, I could see that as... I could see that as credible. It doesn't even, even if you took it seriously, it just, it just sounds crazy. What are you going to get him on? We're going to get him on him being crazy or eccentric. But I mean, I'll go on with this. Um, and the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What? Is it which these witnesses against thee? <laughs> King James English sucks. Uh, but Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that you tell us whether you, I'm not saying thou, you be the Christ, the Son of God. And Jesus said unto them, You said it. Nevertheless, I say unto you hereafter, you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Well, my bad. Didn't I just say in Luke I didn't think that that was in context? That's totally my bad. It is. So, I mean, Matthew records virtually the same thing, the same answer, okay? Um, though all of the other specifics around that not so much the same. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witness? Behold, now ye have heard this blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, He's guilty of death. Um, then did they spit in his face and buffeted him, and others smote him. Um, with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is it? he that smote thee. Apparently, um, 
him just saying that this would happen is uh, is blasphemy. I mean, I see nothing in the law that would bar somebody from from making a claim like this. You might, in the law, if somebody made a claim like this, a prophet made a claim or anything else, you might actually wait to see if that came to pass. So, whoever these people are, these leaders are, the last thing that they're concerned with is the actual law. Now, in Matthew's account, after all of this takes place, because remember, here's Matthew. Matthew said that Peter followed him afar off unto the high priest's palace, and when he went in, he sat with the servants to see the end. He watched the whole thing, but not Luke. Not Luke. He had already run out before it, it ever started. And then they have the account of um, Peter denying Jesus. Um, pretty similar to Luke's. Um, interestingly enough, though, and I know we're not going too far, but in Matthew, if you flip over to chapter 27, it says, When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. They did that in the morning? says Matthew. But wait a minute. Wait just a darn minute. I just saw in Luke, I just saw that they said, Luke twenty two sixty six, And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council, saying, Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, They're having their hearing at the break of day. But according to Matthew, at the break of day, their hearing was over, and they decided to lead him to Pilate. Now herein I am done with Luke chapter 22, and we only have two chapters to go. I would say some of these things that we've seen are rather significant. Rather unfortunately, we do have boys kissing boys in both accounts, but there are some pretty significantly different things just concerning the specifics of mostly from the time that they're in the garden forward, even though those things like the arguing at the Last Supper, the various passages that we saw that we can't find anywhere else. Satan entered into Judas. Um, angels came and ministered to him. Sell your cloak and buy a sword. Nowhere else. That's significant. Definitely the trial, the specifics of the trial. Very significant. Did Peter stay and watch the whole trial and then ran out? Or, as soon as he came up to the fire, did he have his confrontation with the people and then run out? It's hard to tell if we just have Luke to go by. But, um, so, there's that. And this at number 17. And hopefully, we've got two chapters left. Hopefully, two more episodes. Three tops, maybe a recap. We'll see. Uh, and then we'll be through with that. So, until next time. Take care. If you're a boy, don't don't kiss other boys.